one second. Oh, this is live stream. Okay, so if you're here tonight, you're probably interested about buying your first home or you're currently going through this journey. And you may have some questions about what to do, how to buy a house, what happens after you've signed a contract and so on. So I will go quickly. I only get 10 minutes to talk. All of our speakers will only have 10 minutes to talk. And then we will answer some of the questions you have. Give me a sec. Where is my thing? Share. Okay. 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 Awesome. Cool. Right. Now, for any of you that would like this, excuse the sound, <laughs> let me know and I can email this to you after the session as well. So I've put together a really cool home buying um, guide. It just basically answers all of your burning questions. So we're just quickly going to go through it and address as we go. So there are different types of mortgages, there are different lenders criteria, there's pre-approval process and there are conditions. And once your offer gets accepted, what happens next? Um, for the Instagram people, I'm so sorry, you can't see this. So what we're gonna do, <laughs> can someone come and hold this for me, please? <laughs> right, hold it like this so people can see us. Fantastic. Awesome. So some of my tips here is purchase what you can afford, all right? Don't try to jump above your head because at the end of the day, you are the ones that will be paying this mortgage. Not me, not the bank, you will be the one. So try to be reasonable. Your first home is not your forever home. It doesn't have to be your forever home. So understand that. Now, what we also talk about with my clients is know your numbers. So make sure don't get into any other debt. And if you already got yourself into any debt, like personal loans, credit cards, lay-by facilities, try to get rid of them before you get yourself on a home buying journey, if possible. Um, we also talk about it. I mean, this will come down a bit later in your journey once you already have a property down, but we talk about how to repay your mortgage faster as well. So what are the lenders are looking for? The lenders are looking at five different seats. So we talk about the character, capacity, capital, conditions, and collateral. I love this little sound <laughs> of um, doing this. I don't know if I mute myself, if that will go mute. Or not. Okay. So for the first home buyers, what we talk about is you need at least 10% deposit. If you fall under Kayanga Aura, if you fall under Kayanga Aura um, criteria, we can even get away with 5%. So don't lose hope if you think you don't have much money, but if you only have 5% deposit, you've been in a job for more than 12 months and you earn a certain amount that meets the criteria, we can actually pull you across under Kayanga Aura and get you the pre-approval. For any of those people that don't fall under Kayanga Aura criteria, we can do 10% deposit applications as well, but it has to be a live deal. What we mean by live deal is you have to go out first, put an offer, come back to me with the live deal, and then I can take you to the bank. I hope that's understandable so far. Um, once you have a pre-approval in place, usually they last between two to three months as well. Now, this is a guide that I've created. As I said to you, you know, your first home is not your forever home and you have a little checklist to go through it to understand what would be a good house to buy. Fantastic. I love how many people are there on Facebook, um, on Instagram. This is great. This is the first time I've done such a cool hybrid where we've got Instagram, Facebook, and at the same time, we've got a live people sitting here in front of us. <laughs> So this is great. Um, and then we've got conditions that you'll have to put down, but I'll leave this for our beautiful lawyer to, to cover. They will, you have to get registered valuation done as well. Has it been 10 minutes yet? You guys can tap on me. Awesome. You let me know when you want me to. <laughs> and then um, once your offer has been accepted, you've gone unconditional, we're getting you to settlement, and then we're arranging your insurance and stuff like that as well. So all of these things are in this guide. So if you want it, hit me with an email after the session and or just flick me an email um, with your details and I will be able to 
get this across to you. Um, there we go. That's me. Um, oh, cool. There are other people asking, can I please have this? Awesome. Yep, you can. You can have this. Awesome. We'll cover the Kiwi Saver at the end of the session. I'll just wait for Tracy to do her bit and then we'll talk about the Kiwi Saver. Cool. So basically, just a quick summary recap from me. If you're a first home buyer, if you've got five or 10% deposit, we can get you across the line. Come to me first. Let me do the numbers. What's actually possible first? And then you can go out there and see what you can buy. Try to avoid properties um, with monolithic cladding, please. Do not go there. We'll talk about monolithic cladding at one point. <laughs> People are laughing at me around the room. <laughs> this, yeah, the real estate agent is not liking me right now. We'll leave, we'll leave those properties for people with more than 20% deposit, please. <laughs> but for the first home buyers, stick to your brick and tile, stick to those um, timber houses or build new. And what else can I give you as a word of this one? Um, I don't know. They'll do? Okay, they want me to shut up now. So without further ado, I will call in Georgie with her PowerPoint presentation. I'm just gonna stop sharing this and I'm gonna start sharing that. Now we'll turn this around. Thank you. Over there. And hopefully, right, hold on. Well, do you want us to turn off the lights? Yeah, going up here. yeah if, it, if it's going upstairs, I'll need you to stand there, please. And hopefully people can hear you. Um, we'll do a quick sound check when you get there. Oh, uh, Okay. Hello. Yeah. Cool. You go over there. Awesome. And I will awesome. share. Wait, wait. Right, show. Oh, oh, we've got more people coming in. Awesome. Hello. Please. Welcome. Welcome. Right. Now, guys on Zoom, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see this? Yep, cool. They can see it. Guys on Instagram, can you see it? Yep, they can see it. Perfect. A bit in reverse. A bit in reverse, but they can see it. Cool. Go ahead. Yep, I'll do the clicking. All right. Hi everyone, I am Gigi from Boyle and & Co and welcome to our first time buying seminar. So I'm just going to run through a little bit more about the, the actual buying process and, and how that looks um, in a little bit more detail about the actual campaign. So uh, it can be a very daunting process, but the good news is it doesn't have to be. Um, so Ask lots of questions, you do your due diligence, and if you surround yourself with really knowledgeable people, um, it can be much easier, which is very good. So, we just want to test um, your knowledge. So, um, market knowledge is really important. So, we'll just go through and do this quiz. So, um, how much am I? So, I was sold about a month ago 120 squares, 89. Square meter section, three beds, one bath, two garage, 1990, renovated interior, and an RV of 640. What do you think it might have sold for? Eight, 820. Some good bids there. Yeah. Okay. This one sold for? Click. <laughs> Click. <laughs> 780,000. So you're pretty close. Also, we've got one more. So this uh, property is Pada Pada Ubu. Um, again, it's three beds, one bath, 100 square metres, 830 square metre section. It was tiny, um, and the RV was 495. What do you reckon this may sell for? 650, yeah? 525. 525? Oh, <laughs> all right. So you might be surprised because this one actually sold for 675,000. So, Again, this just re-emphasizes the fact that you have to do your market knowledge so that you feel comfortable and confident in buying property. Awesome. All right. Okay. Cool. So the first part of the process is really important, as you've been so, um, touched on this before, that you should have a must-have and a nice-to-have. And this allows you to stick very much within your budget. So a must-have might be three bedrooms. It might be that it needs to be in Paraparuma because it's close to the train station. It might need a backyard because you've got a dog, right? But a nice-to-have might be a non-suite or a second lounge or something like that. But as soon as you start putting these nice-to-haves on your must-haves, 
the price starts going up and then you might be looking at properties that are actually that you're not able to attain essentially so certainly work your way through this and work out what you have to have um so once you've done that where do you do your research so eight out of ten buyers are going to trade me so it's the most popular portal to buy property but there are other sites like realestate.co.nz, QZ, One Hub, and the likes. They all have their own algorithms um, as far as looking at um, price points and things like that. So certainly do your research and look across the, the collection of websites to be able to get your information there. Okay. So, um, right, you found a property and you want to uh, go along, you've got an open home, you're checking it out. What questions do you ask? Salesperson who lived at the property. So, probably the first most important question that you want to ask is Are there any disclosures? So, disclosures are information that has been passed on by the vendor or established by the salesperson that we then need to pass on to potential purchasers. And this really does allow, allow them to make a decision whether they want to offer on the property, what they might offer on the property, and whether or not they need to do some more investigation into the offer. Um, is there a building file or a loan report? So again, this just gives you a little bit more information in regards to the construction of the property. And a loan report details a little bit more about consents and notices, hazard maps and things like that. Again, these can be quite detailed reports. So sometimes the specialist might need to look over these. Why the vendor seller? This is a good question because it establishes why or how motivated the vendors are. So, you know, if they're relocating overseas, you've identified that they're very much um, And you might be able to be a bit cheeky with your price. Um, how does or will the new district plan impact this property? Um, so that's sort of something that's an initiative through council, um, sorry, through government, um, which is looking at the infrastructure and sort of boosting that within certain zones. So um, you'll get a little bit more information of that in your limit report now as well. Um, has a building report been done on the property? So sometimes you will get a building report um, provided with your information pack, particularly if it is um, maybe a problematic property. Um, sometimes there may have been a building report done on the property through the campaign, through another purchaser. We have to um, pass on that information. Um, and particularly if something has been identified and we can agree with that, we then have to disclose. Um, a price guide that might be given, there might be a bit of a price point there, there might be no price point, there might be buyer feedback. Um, what channels are included? Pretty obvious here. Things like settlement deposit, are those things negotiable if you want to put an offer? So all really good questions to ask. All right. All right, then we've got marketing strategy. So you would see this once you've started looking through, you've gone through your master questions and you come up here like, right, okay, gosh, this is a deadline sale. Uh, it's a tender, it's an auction. So there's so many different ways of marketing your property and they do fall into no price marketing and price marketing. We'll go into these with a little bit more detail. So one of the more popular um, campaigns at the moment is a deadline sale. So it's two to four weeks. It does have a closing date and time. So what that means is that you have to submit your offer by that time. Um, it uses the standard sale and purchase agreement, which Tracy's going to go through in a little bit more detail. Um, you can be unconditional or conditional, so that is a benefit to this process. Um, you dictate the price, um, your settlement, your deposit, your conditional dates, what your conditions are. Um, uh, it can be filled out by yourself, it can be filled out with a sales person at office, or you can sit down and do it with your solicitor. Um, it can and, and usually does present itself as a multi office situation. So what that means is that you're going up against other people. We do encourage you to put your best foot forward because you may not have a chance to renegotiate. Um, and yeah, so we encourage you not to hold back in that sort of situation. Um, yep. <laughs> Sorry, moving on. So tender is the same principles as um, a deadline sale. The only difference is that it uses a tender document and you are locked into the process. So the tender usually has up to five working days to be able to make their mind up in regards to what offer they want to accept, reject, et cetera. So really important if you're offering in a tender process that you do not offer on another property during that time because you may run the risk of buying two properties. So yeah. 
do your research on that one there. Um, option, so um, this is typically three to four weeks. Um, you do have to be unconditional to be able to bid in this scenario. Um, terms and conditions are presented um, in the option contract. The bid reserve is set by the vendor. Um, once the property is sold, the paperwork is completed and the deposit is expected to be paid then and there. Um, if the reserve is not met, negotiations can begin with anyone else that is bidding. Um, and if that doesn't happen, if there was conditional interest waiting in the wings, then you can start investigating that a little bit further as well. And um, if you're interested, pre-option offers can be put in. What happens if the option may move forward or it may be cancelled altogether? Um, Client by negotiation. So very similar document in the sense that it is a sale um, standard sum purchase agreement. No time frame for this. So essentially it's first in first term. Why put um, depending on office policy there? It's just that some offices do have a seven-day embargo, meaning that you can't accept offers during that time frame. Um, same with, um, yep, we're moving on. <laughs> we moved on really quickly then. We'll go straight to asking price. I'm aware that we've got limited um, time frame. So this is, this is a priced um, situation. So again, no time frame, but if vendor has established a price that they would like to sell their property for. Um, again, standard sale purchase agreement, um, and it can present a multi-office situation as well. Um, so calling for interest. So this process is followed when you don't have a tender, a tender deadline or um, option. Um, so there's no set date here. Um, policies differ between companies. Again, what I was talking about with that embargo scenario. So once the offer is received, other interested parties are notified. So that might be somebody who's come through your open home. Could be somebody who's just had a private visit, or it could be somebody who's just sent an email. So we go out to all those people, let them know that we've received an offer, and then it's given them an opportunity to be able to put something on paper. You see a new time frame, so it might be an hour's time or something like that, or it could even be tomorrow. Um, if other offers are received, then the salesperson must notify you and let you know that they've received other offers. And at this point, you have the opportunity to change and update your current offer. Um, offers may then be presented to the vendor for consideration. All right, we're wrapping up. Okay, so quickly, multi-offer situation. So but there's more than one on the table. Uh, now the buyer, it's now buyer versus buyer. So it's not buyer versus vendor, you're competing against other people. Um, so present the strongest offer possible, may not get a chance to negotiate further, and you must be aware that you're in a multi-office situation. So with this, all this information is just trying to get you to be able to win at uh, whatever sort of property that you're going for. So basically surround yourself with knowledgeable people, ask questions. It doesn't matter if it's a silly question, and it doesn't really matter if you have to ask it three or four times. It's all good. Um, do your due diligence. Assess what the property is valuable to you instead of worrying about what the vendor wants. Sometimes a vendor might want a really unrealistic price point and you see it at a different price point. So just focus on what you're willing to pay. Make your offer as clean as possible so it'll look more attractive. Now, I'll just put here as well, assess the risk. So make sure you've done your due diligence before you do this. But a cleaner offer will look more attractive to a vendor. And put your best foot forward. And there we go. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Uh, people are asking if they can have a copy of this of slide show as well. I can email. Yeah, we can people. do that as one pack. As one pack. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much for this. And we are moving on to the more serious presenter tonight. Um, okay. I hope I made you smile. Right. Okay, just a second, people, please. I'm just pulling up. Tracy Purvin, a director. It's not often we get a director involved. Um. <laughs> also, now, hold on a second, just a quick check. Um, Zoom people, can you see my screen? Can you please give me thumbs up? Perfect, I love it. Great, they can see it. People on Instagram are seeing it. Wonderful, you packed yourself beautifully. Let's go. 
Yeah, we don't know if you're going to be aware of the law connection. Uh, we're based in Ramati and we also have an office in Waikanae. And we're a, a general practice law firm, but tonight I'm going to be talking about some of the, well, very briefly about some of the uh, matters that you need to consider if you're going to put an offer on a property. Um, thanks to Georgie and Vivaniso, you've got a really good understanding of what you need to do at the very start of the process. And often where I come into it, as I look at myself, really is the uh, end of the situation. I quite often get the agreement for sale and purchase when you've already signed it. So hopefully what I can give you today is just some tips on what to look for and what to consider uh, before you make that offer. Um, a lot of what I might say is, is a repetition of what Georgie's already covered, but nonetheless, it remains important. And if you rang me before you put an offer, which you're welcome to do, by the way, this is some of the stuff you should look at. When you are ready to make an offer, you've done your market research, you've done your due diligence, you will be presented with the agreement for sale and purchase. Now, some of the real estate agents might post that to you, as Georgie said, when you e sorry, email it to you and you fill it out. If you're concerned and you're not sure, go back to the real estate agent, or if you prefer, go to your lawyer and ask for some guidance. It seems simple, but one of the very, very common mistakes on an agreement for sale and purchase is people not putting their full names. So if your name is Robert the Builder, put Robert the Builder, not Bob the Builder. If you are a trustee of a trust, then you need to put all the trustees' names on there and all the trustees must sign. If you are acting as attorney for someone uh, under an enduring power of attorney for property, then you must sign like that and you must also provide the real estate agent with a certificate of non-revocation. Um, in, in short, that's really a piece of paper that says as at the date you're signing the agreement for sale and purchase, your enduring power of attorney has not been revoked by the person who gave it to you. Okay? Other things to consider are the conditions. Now, generally speaking, you will want to consider a limb report, insurance condition. Um, uh, what else have we got? There's also, there's also very important. Um, sorry? Yes, thank you. A toxicology report. If you're, if you're wanting to buy a property that may have been rented for some time and you're unsure about it, toxicology reports are good ideas. Even if you don't get a report, you might want to put in a condition about you doing a toxicology. Um, uh, test yourself, okay? Um, there might be specialist reports. If you think the wiring's dodgy, put in an, an electrical report. Um, but obviously, finance is a key one, but hopefully you've got that lined up by seeing the seven so in advance, but you still want to put that condition in. The other thing is when you get to the settlement date, please, please, and I can't emphasize this enough, give yourself enough time to get everything done. If you are using KiwiSaver, or if you are using, if you're getting a Kaina or a grant, you must give yourself and them sufficient time to process that money and get it to your lawyer's trust account. Now, Kaina Aura and uh, KiwiSaver providers generally ask that it is 10 working days uh, for the processing, right? So they will tell you, allow 10 working days. And that's, that's when I will get your money if it's been approved. If you're not sure about your KiwiSaver and whether you qualify, write to your KiwiSaver before you make any offer on a property and just check with them as to whether or not you meet the base criteria, okay? That's just have you been in the country long enough, have you been contributing long enough, those sorts of things. Make yourself feel secure about that. Sydney so will also help you with that, won't you, Sydney? So? Yes. <laughs> Look at it, just okay. All right. Now, the insurance, um, it seems silly, but you can actually... Do a way of putting the condition in if you want and if it's not required by the bank by making a phone call to an insurance company and saying, hey, I want to buy this property here. Will you insure it? Um, and it is really, really important. No insurance, no finance, because no, no bank is going to end if they can't secure, if they can't, sorry, have insurance over there, over the property, all right? Uh, the other thing is, of course, as I mentioned, uh, the specialist reports. Don't be afraid to put conditions in if you feel this way. You are going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? And you think to yourself, oh, should I buy a limb? You know, because a limb's 400 something dollars. Um, builders reports are 700 something dollars. But when you are going to sign up for a mortgage for 30 years for $500,000 plus, you know, is it worth it? Um, you have to answer that question. But there are ways and means, you know, sometimes as Georgie pointed out, the vendors will have provided builders reports and limb reports, so make use of those things. A lot of it looks like gobbledygook in terms of the limb report and the builders report. 
and you can go back to the councils, you can ask your builders, please do that if you're unsure. Um, well, I can give you some legal advice. I certainly can't interpret building plans, and you probably wouldn't want me to anyway, uh, <laughs> because I've no spatial reasoning with that stuff. All right, so we'll go to the next one, is anything so? Um, the sorts of titles on the agreement of sale and purchase, they talk of fee simple, they talk of uh, cross lease. When you see Georgie and you're making and you're putting an offer and she will cover this off, but, and there isn't insufficient time for me to go into that with you today, but if you were to make an offer and you were unsure before you submitted it, then ring me and I'll talk you through that process. The most common forms of title are fee simple and cross lease. Each come with their own um, own uh, things to deal with, but that's where your lawyer and your real estate agent can guide you, okay? So what do you what should be aware of? are some of those, those things. So also on the agreement for sale and purchase on the front, there are the conditions uh, to tick the boxes as it were, you say yes or no, okay? And there's the finance there, the limb, the toxicology. Uh, and if you select yes there, then you need to be aware that as part of the agreement, if for example, you had, you um, selected yes on the front of the agreement for sale and purchase for finance, and then you were unable to get finance, as part of the agreement, you would need, you may be required to, on request, to provide evidence of why your finance was refused. Um, so in some respects, it's actually better to have the conditions you might want put into the contract added in under the further terms of sale, where those same requirements aren't necessary. Okay, once again, talk to your real estate agent, talk to me before you sign. Next one, if that's okay, is you so? Uh, right, and then, <laughs> Bruce and Lotus may sound, you're now going to be a homeowner, okay? You have, you have a lot of debt, potentially. You also have uh, an asset that you need to deal with. Don't just look at this in isolation. Have a think at the time that you're going to purchase your house, should I make a will? And my answer to that is absolutely yes, okay? You need to consider what's going to happen if you were to buy this house and then something happened to you. I know you've exhausted your keep and saver probably, but you do have this asset that will increase in value, hopefully, and, and you need to deal with that if something were to happen to you, um, unfortunately, if that was there for, um, even if you were to lose your mental capacity. So you've got a will, and you may look at that enduring powers of attorney just in case you lost your mental capacity. All right, I think I've covered everything, ladies. Was there anything else we, again, we were going to look over? No, nope, we've covered titles, we've covered how to buy a house, we've covered what you need to buy a house. I think we're good. So I'm opening up the floor for some questions. Oh, yes. Nope. Just one other thing. If you are um, submitting your own agreement for sale and purchase, I draw your attention right to the very top of the page where they have the date written. And it's so small and it's at the top, but it is often the thing that is forgotten. Uh, and then we'll, and I'll get an agreement for sale and purchase and I'll have 10 working days to confirm your finance, but I don't actually know when that starts. So just remember at the very top, don't forget to date it. Thank you. Can you explain the whole number there? If that's your question, yep, we can definitely get to it. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a moment there. Um, and I just need to check my phone. Check please if it's connected. Not connected. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, we don't want to lose, we don't want to lose people halfway through. Um fantastic. And Instagram people the same to you. If you have any questions, thank you so much for bearing with us all this time. Um, if you don't have any questions, check them in there, we'll get to you. Cool. So my people here, my people here. Let's let's look at your questions. I've got one for you, probably Tracy. What should I be aware of when combining Kiwi Savers to buy a home? I don't know what that means. I don't know whether it's two people buying together, maybe combining Kiwi Savers. Oh, are you, if you're talking about uh, a couple uh, that are together then beyond you buying a house 
my advice would be look at a property agreement between you, okay, uh, um, to say uh, just in case the relationship were to, yeah, to uh, uh, end. Uh, but if you are two individuals purchasing a property together using your own Kiwi Savers, um, then you might want, uh, rather than what's called a contracting out agreement, uh, you might want a property agreement. And that agreement would say something along the lines of, well, um, I, Bob, the builder, have contributed $10,000. You, you, Mary Canary, contributed $10,000. Um, and we own this house together as tenants in common because that's a form of ownership. Uh, where the parties have an, an equal or unequal share based on their contributions. And then you record how you might want those uh, contributions and to rates or um, the loan agreements, and the loan, sorry, installments to go forward. And you would record that in your property agreement. And you'd sign that, get some advice on that. So it would also deal with what would happen if you both decided to sell. Yeah. Time frames and the actual sale purchase yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Time. Please, please, my advice is it's best not to rely on KiwiSaver for your deposit. And I'm sure Zebaniso and both George, Georgie agree. Um, use your KiwiSaver uh, for your uh, purchase uh, for the whole settlement sum. If you rely on it for your deposit, you run the risk of not getting it in time to do so. Um, because uh, if you confirm a condition, then you have, you can, sorry, if you confirm your contract or conditions satisfied and it's unconditional, um, then you need to pay your deposit and you might not get that from KiwiSaver in time. Fantastic. Did you guys hear that? Can I get some thumbs up, please? I love getting thumbs up, it's so cute. <laughs> Oops. Ah. I've lost. No, I haven't. That's cool. I just wanted to disconnect whatever is behind. Cool. We got thumbs up. Yep. That answered the question. Fantastic. Um, what was else? The, okay. I will email whoever wants to be emailed. I can email you all three PowerPoints that you've seen tonight. So one from Georgie, one from me, one from Tracy. So that should give you a little bit of information as well. And um is there anything else you guys want to ask us before we go and start eating food? Sorry for those that are online. I want to know, we get on the top of your start of purchase trail where you've got the name of the people, there's also a section that says and or nominee. Can you explain what that's about, please? In short, um, probably easier to answer by way of example, if I may. Um, I've had a situation where um, one of the party's spouses was out of the, um, the country and they needed, they weren't able to get the funding from the bank themselves, but they needed to make an offer on the property, right? So they had the and or nominee. Uh, after the agreement for sale and purchase was signed and um, by both parties, then we did what's called a deed of nomination where we changed the purchaser, who was the person that wasn't able to get the finance, to the name of the person or the spouse that could. And then it's just like a, a swap over the ownership, whereby the person who was nominated agrees that they will take over and um, carry out the terms of the contract. So also, so if it's like family from Joseph Bain and Brown, yep. um, and they leave and they want it to then be in the family trust. That works as well, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yep. And that is that is reasonably common. Yep. Okay. I see a question comes here through for Georgie. Georgie, what um what do you think the property prices are gonna do? I mean that classic question. <laughs> I'm the, a real estate agent, not an economist. <laughs> <laughs> What are you seeing in the but market? I think what we're seeing at the moment is just that there is um, a general consensus between vendors and buyers being on the same page at the moment as far as property prices. Um, probably at the start of the year, vendors were over here, buyers were over here, mm -hmm. and it just feels like the market has settled. So yes, we certainly, what we saw last year where we had less properties and more people. So we had a demand supply issue and hence property spiked. Whereas now what we're saying is flipped, we have a lot of supply. Um, 
and less demand, and all buyers have more choice. So then we're just seeing prices stabilised a little bit. So there's a little bit of talk that properties have gone back to the price range of what they were sort of early 2021, late 2020. And when you look at prices of what things are being sold for, that's, that's certainly what you're saying. But yeah, it just seems to have stabilised a little bit. Properties that are, uh, need a little bit of work and a little bit of tension, they've certainly up the price sensitive. Thank you. Thank you. All right. No questions for me. How fantastic. This is first for me. Nobody will have any questions for me. I must have done a really good job. Um, I have a question, Zibini. Sorry. Oh, no. Oh, no. What is it? Um, in a situation where you have a first home buyer and they're not quite there, they might not have all their money um, or all their ducks in a row, can they come to you and can you sit down with them and do a plan about how they can get to the point where um, they can then apply for finance or get to that point where they're comfortable making an offer on a property? Yeah, absolutely. At the moment, I'm, I'm working with two clients that um, need a bit of cleaning up of their finances first. For instance, they had too much debt all over the place and we are consolidating all that debt first into one managed um, repayment, you know, personal loan. And then we're getting them a pre-approval for a home loan. Because at the moment, if I present them like this to the bank, it will be an instant decline, it looks too messy, um, and it's just too, ma too many repayments. So we're going from two and a half thousand dollars per month in repayments that they have across all their debt to just thousand dollars a month. So that's freeing up quite a lot of income for me to present to the bank that they can actually afford to pay their mortgage as well so yeah absolutely i i've been working with clients over the past three four years even getting them to the point so each year we have a bit of a catch up a check up where they are whether they've repaid their debt whether they're raising now whether they've saved some money and then we go further so um it's for some people it's not an easy step just to get up and buy a house for a lot of them we need to educate them on how to get better with finances and the good thing for clients my services are free so um, I love doing it. Yeah. Am I right in thinking that um, people shouldn't just view their assets as being cash? Uh, I've got, I recall a story about um, a, a person who wanted to buy a house uh, and they were short on their deposit, but they uh, were working with a broker to get to the point where they could make an offer, for example, but they sold their car. They had a, a vintage car. So it's looking out, isn't it more just, you know, looking out outside of the norm? Yeah. what you might be able to um, yeah. you know, sell and, and no, put towards. We, we have to get that. creative. Yeah. And I don't know, the next question could be for me or for you or for George, yeah. <laughs> or any of us. It says, what options do you have if you are relying on KiwiSaver for your deposit? You. <laughs> um, yeah. Extend the condition period yeah. to get the KiwiSaver out. Yeah. Um, to get an overdraft from me. <laughs> Yeah, you yeah. might need an overdraft yeah. on your bank. Um, also, the other, I always say, look, have a plan B. Uh, have you got family <laughs> that you can tap on the shoulder? I'm not being, I'm not bit joking there. I mean, it's just a, a short-term perhaps loan to get you across the line for the deposit. The key thing about that, though, and I will, mean, I can't emphasize this enough, is don't put down a deposit in your agreement for sale and purchase that you don't have. Only put down the cash that you have available as the deposit. Now, I know that some of the agreements for sale and purchase might come through with a, sometimes with a 10% already down there in the deposit. Is that right, Georgie? That's the standard 10%, but you yeah. see a cross section of 5% or a dollar. It doesn't have to be a cent, it can be a dollar. And it can be even if you dollars Yeah. So only put down what you can afford because because you, you just, if you cannot pay the deposit, then all sorts of problems can occur so as I say um, you know talk to your broker see if there can be some some uh, arrangement made with the bank um, where you can get an, uh, um, sorry, an overdraft um, to help you pay that deposit talk to family see if you can get a, a loan with them uh, until your finance you know it comes through and then you can maybe pay them back later or however it works or once you're uh, in a position where you've saved up amount money it, however it works it is tricky but please don't put down a deposit that you cannot afford to pay. Oh, hopefully that answers the question. Awesome. Well, we're getting um, 
English department sometimes. <laughs> I'm like, we're getting wrapped up here. Um, don't know if that's the right way. To... We are wrapping up. Thank you so much. We are not wrapping anybody. <laughs> People are laughing around the room. Um, so thank you so much for all those attended tonight. I really hope this was educational for you and slightly inspiring to get on the property ladder. If you do have any specific questions that are down my field or George's field or Tracy field, honestly, feel free to reach out. You can um, find all of our details in the registration. I think when you registered, there were some details from us. But if you do need to talk to me about your finances, don't um, don't hesitate to contact me and please flick me an email because I'm, I'm just afraid Zoom may not save the chat for me. Flick me an email with your details for me to email you back the PowerPoint presentations that we've covered tonight and I will do that for you in the next 24 hours. The moment I get your email, I'll email you back, I promise. So thank you so much. I hope this was informative and off we go to have some drinks and food. Thank you. Bye.